He could be frightening, obviously. I mean, he had, he had the rage of his youth. He couldn't bear being late. He was, you know, like that. He was instantaneous. Well, I'm sure it was. Ambushed by love is the word. You, you just never know when it's going to hit you. I think that this brought about an extraordinary release of feeling, of sustained feeling. It's not to say that Vaughan Williams had not been incredibly vigorous and passionate previously. But it's the specific expression of that work which I think is new. Rafe and Ursula were now involved in an intense secret affair that was to last 15 years. The Valentine poems she lavished on him each February have recently come to light. Although he remained based at home in Dorking and she was often in London, there were no half measures in their relationship. That remains for some a delicate subject, even 50 years after his death. In his nature, there was an earthiness and a, a passionate quality um, which was not nourished um, uh, as, as it could have been. Um, and when Ursula um, came upon the scene, maybe she was able to give him some of this. Both my parents were quite shy, but I do know that it used to amuse them enormously that Ina Boyle, the Irish composer, who I think didn't ever understand the relationship, uh, used to refer to Ursula as the secretary. There was not a very good reception for Ursula in the family, but I don't know how unfair that was, I don't know. Why? I think they felt that, um, I wish you would probably what my grandmother would call an adventurous or something like that, you know. Any remaining doubt over whether Adeline knew about Rafe's affair is dispelled by a Valentine card sent him by Ursula two years after the war. The envelope that landed on the White Gate's doormat made little attempt at concealment. I think all of them were tactful uh, and behaved, I was going to say in a gentlemanly way, whatever the word would be, um, uh, and were concerned not to hurt each other. I mean, they were all vulnerable. Did it represent any sort of disloyalty to Adeline? I can't answer that. I really don't know. She might have sanctioned it and been glad for him. The exuberance of his Eighth Symphony spoke of a man in the prime of life. The Hanover Terrace house was very beautiful. She had filled it with beautiful things. I remember it was full of of light and sunlight and laughter. And he suddenly came up with this uh, ridiculous rhyme. Uncle Joe and Auntie Mabel fainted at the breakfast table. Children, let this be a warning. Never do it in the morning. <laughs> he and Ursula used to seize upon folk the moment it came out, and they would go through it, and he would make a little note of all the pairs of shoes that he'd like to see her wearing. She was a wonderful dresser. And Rafe, so she told me, he didn't tell me that directly, he loved her in high heels and she was rather tall, but that didn't matter. <laughs> they must have gone out every night in London to either a concert or a theatre or something, or had people to dinner or entertain. I mean, it must have been heaven for him. He was very serious and he laughed all the time. Despite all the activity, the creative urge never slackened as one of his young composer friends overheard. When the fire was up, he would, he would come up with extraordinary new things. It was about 4 a.m. Simply out of my sleep, I heard this extraordinary sound trickling down through the ceiling, where there was a little honky-tonk piano. And then stomp, 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 as he'd go back to his desk. And then he'd go back to the piano and went on and on and on. 
he was working on, as I realized later, the slow movement of the Ninth Symphony. It was very strange music, music actually being called forth from silence and from the night. It was a magical experience, obviously, to me as a, a young composer to hear above this very great man um, searching for his own dream. I think he's England's greatest composer of the 20th century, and I adore and know nearly all of Elgar, one of my favorite of all composers, but I do place four millions above that. The older I get, uh, I think I, I love it even more. And having worked a lot with, with, with Britain and Tippett, it is so equal to them and just so different. I find it more enriching the longer I live. I, I can swallow it whole, even the weaker pieces. So that's its significance. It doesn't change. But I hope I change in listening to it. The brooding unease of the Ninth Symphony escaped its first audience. They cheered him to the echo, but few understood it. Only later did they realize his passions had taken him further on into another world. I wrote to VW afterwards and said that I was very impressed, but I didn't quite uh, get the hang of it, basically. Anyway, he said, Dear Jeremy, Thank you so much for writing. I am so glad you liked it, as far as you did. As the man said about Brahms, it ought never to be heard for the first time. I hope you're doing some fine composition yourself. Ursula sends her love. Yours, RVW. <laughs> Touché. 